So Chain is a brand new company. We're based in California. We have an office in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, we are hiring. Uh, we're eight people right now, and we're working on a really big, ambitious goal. And that big, ambitious goal is to create the best interface to the blockchain. And not just the Bitcoin blockchain, but to a wide variety of blockchains. And our thesis really is that the world is going to depend on the blockchain a lot more in the future than it does now. That every passing day, every passing month, the world's going to rely more and more and more and more on the blockchain for all sorts of applications. We believe that. That's why we're doing this. We also believe that the blockchain is quite hard to manage, and it's going to get harder and harder to manage for companies and developers because of the size of the blockchain and because people are pushing its limits to do all sorts of innovative things. I know many of you guys are doing that. So we set out to build a platform for developers and to give them access to the blockchain so they can build innovative things and change the world. And Ryan, uh, who is one of the founders along with me and a couple others, is going to talk tonight briefly about the architecture of the blockchain itself, to give a quick overview for those of you who are new to, uh, the, to Bitcoin and to the Bitcoin protocol and how the blockchain works. And then second, he's going to talk about our API and how it works and what it's good for and what's coming next. So that as you guys are building things this summer or at your companies or in your spare time, uh, you can rely on us to help you. And um, the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Ryan, if you go to chain.com, I think we just put up a new site like in the last 10 minutes. Uh, we're shipping every single day, lots of things. Uh, there's an email on there, it's hello at chain. It goes to everyone in the company. And uh, every email that goes to that email address gets a response. So if you have anything you want to ask that's technical or sort of anything Bitcoin related or frankly anything at all, we're responding to literally any email that goes there, uh, at least for now. Just reach out and say hi. Again, my name is Adam. This is Brian. Uh, How'd you get Adam. that domain name? Sorry? How'd you get chain.com? It's domain. I purchased it with all of our money. <laughs> and now we're broke. So we are hiring, but only for free internships. Uh, so this is somebody instead of the whole company? No, we want everyone at the company to hear everything that's coming in right now. We think it's important. Over time, we'll get big organizational structures and really boring, but for now, everyone is all hands on deck because this problem requires everyone's, everyone's attention. It's a really hard problem to solve. So with that, I will turn it over to Ryan. Um, and thank you again for coming. Thanks. What, uh, quick technical question. What do I have to do to uh, switch over the video here? Uh, I don't think this is my screen, but I'm plugged in. Ah. Is there a, like another computer that's plugged this in? Some of the data structures that we're building on top of Bitcoin and the blockchain to make it easier to build interesting applications. Uh, and then finally, I'll just show you guys a, a few quick examples of some of the things that we've built on top of those, uh, the, those higher order structures. All right, so let's, uh, let's kind of take a, uh, a very abstract, uh, high level view here. Um, so there's a software called Bitcoin D. And Bitcoin D is a C++ program that you can download off GitHub, and you can compile it, and you can install it. 
and you can point it at other Bitcoin D nodes over uh, over a TCP connection. And Bitcoin D also has this uh, blockchain file. So there's one file uh, that has every single tr block and transaction that has ever happened in Bitcoin. And so if you were just to start a Bitcoin D uh, software today, if you were to download it, install it, and turn it on, and, and let it kind of catch up to, to, to where the blockchain has progressed today, uh, it, it would take a long time. I think there's about 30 gigabytes worth of blockchain data that, that, that a Bitcoin D node needs to be able to process uh, new transactions. Um, so once you have your Bitcoin D node up and running, and it's talking to other Bitcoin D nodes, uh, and, and these Bitcoin D nodes, they, uh, they, they, they discover each other through um, a set of hard-coded addresses in, in, in the source code. So when a Bitcoin D node starts up, like it has a, it uses some DNS, but it also has like a list of known peers, so it kind of bootstraps itself. And then the protocol also kind of gossips about peers. And so your Bitcoin node, once it joins into the network, it, it'll find out about other people, and that's how the data synchronization can happen. Um, but it, like I said, so you've got your Bitcoin D software set up, you've got the blockchain uh, initialized, you've got you know, 30 gigabytes of data, and then now your Bitcoin D node is set up to uh, take in new transactions. And th there are a lot of different ways that you can interact with Bitcoin D, but at, at a very high level, what you're going to be doing to it is you're going to be submitting a transaction to Bitcoin D. And that's kind of the interesting uh, thing here. Uh, you you want to generate stuff like addresses or, or wallets, um, but that doesn't necessarily require uh, network connectivity or a database connection. Uh, you know, these are just functions that we can write and, and execute locally on machines without any sort of you know, connection to the database or the network. So as far as Bitcoin D and the network and the database is concerned, it's basically all about sending transactions into Bitcoin D. So uh, it's also important to note that like in, in this case here, like we submitted a new transaction in, into Bitcoin. Uh, that transaction would basically be unconfirmed for a period of time. Uh, and, and what happens is we accumulate these unconfirmed transactions and they sit in, uh, in memory of, of these Bitcoin nodes that are all over the network. And eventually a miner will come along and it'll take these unconfirmed transactions and it'll do its proof of work. And that's, that's a whole other like, uh, topic of discussion is, is you know, how, how, how these miners uh, are, are able to create a block or to, 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 to get a block into the blockchain. But eventually what will happen is somebody will take these unconfirmed transactions They'll put them inside of a block data structure, and then that block data structure will go on top of basically a list of blocks. So here you can see, like this is the the, the, the block at the very bottom, the first block, the Genesis block, and over time, new blocks get added to the top. And inside each block, there is a group of transactions. So you can see here that like a miner may have taken these unconfirmed transactions that were submitted to the, the Bitcoin network. They would have put them into a new block, and they would have been added to the blockchain. <coughs> So that's kind of like the high, the, 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 the high level view of what's going on here. And so now I'm just going to kind of tease apart a couple of those data structures. And I left a lot missing on these. This is by no means comprehensive and I glossed over a lot of stuff. So uh, you know, if, if you want to really get into the details, I would recommend checking out um, uh, Bitcoin uh, on, the, on the website. They have a developer's guide that goes into very detailed and great instructions on, on all of the fields that are in the data structures and, and they go into the specifics of the protocol. So this is just kind of a high level overview of what's going on. Um, so a block, uh, and one way to think about it, Adam was, we were talking about this on the plane right over here, is that a block is just kind of like uh, a, a, a piece of paper and a ledger and transactions are like line items in, the, in, that, in that paper. Um, so you can kind of see that manifest it's, that, that example manifest itself here, where we have um, we have a hash which kind of helps identify the block. It, it also has cryptographic properties that ensures the integrity of the data within the block. We have the height of the block, which, uh, if you recall it here, these are basically the, the heights of the block. So it's like the position in the list. And then each block has a collection of transaction hashes. So these are pointers to, to the actual transaction data structures. So a transaction looks somewhat similar, not, 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 too, uh, not, not too, too, a whole lot of new stuff going on here. So we, we have a hash, which again helps identify the transaction, and it also has cryptographic properties that ensures the integrity of the data within the transaction. Uh, it, it keeps a reference to the block number, to the block by its number and its hash. Um, so it, it's possible uh, that you have two blocks that are at the same height, uh, but they have different transactions within them, so their hashes would be different. Like the cryptographic signature of the data within within the block would be different, but their heights would be the same. 
And there are situations uh, that happen in Bitcoin where you have uh, orphan blocks, or you have forks, or you need to reorganize the blockchain uh, as a consequence of some sort of uh, disagreement and consensus. Um, and so you'll see, like when you're dealing with these low-level data structures, you'll, you'll always see references to both the number and the hash to, to, to help navigate those, uh, those tricky, tricky spots. Um, and then we have uh, inputs and outputs. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of jump to these in the next slide and kind of tease out more what's going on there. Um, but basically a transaction is uh, just the combination of a previous transaction which acts as the input and then a reference to like a new transaction. That's where like the funds are going to be go moving to next. Um, and then finally, uh, one thing that's uh, important to know here, you'll probably hear it a lot when, when you're dealing with uh, you know, consumer Bitcoin applications is uh, confirmations. And so the way that you can compute the confirmations level of a transaction is to look at its block number relative to the, uh, the highest block number in the chain. And so if you submitted a transaction and it was a part of a block and some time went on and two more blocks were added on top of the chain, uh, it, it would have effectively three confirmations. Um, and so it's kind of dicey, you know, uh, when you're thinking about transactions that have one confirmation because it's very possible that, you know, there could be a fork or a reorganization that would happen. Uh, and so when you think about like a transaction that has, you know, very little chance of uh, not being, be, uh, not belonging to a, a block, you really look for confirmations at like, you know, six or seven, uh, th th those types of numbers. So, uh, this, this is an example of an output, and as, as we saw here, uh, you know, a transaction can have many inputs and outputs. And so an output uh, references the, uh, the transaction hash. So this is just a point of the, pit, the, the transaction that is encapsulating this output. Uh, and it also has an index, and we'll see why the index is important later when we look at inputs. Um, but this is just a reference to the position of this particular output within the collection of outputs within the transaction. Uh, and here, it's interesting to note that, um, and, and we use this a lot at Chain, actually. So uh, we, 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 like, we really like to associate every piece of data within a transaction with an address, because there's all sorts of really interesting things that you can do if you know the address that is involved in a particular input or output. Um, and, and, and they're not always, uh, they're not always given to you, um, but, um, and, and this really isn't used for any sort of uh, security or any sort of authorization of the output. Um, it, it's, it, it's really a convenience, uh, at least in the way that we're using it um, at Chain. Uh, but what's, what's really important here is actually the script. And so the script is, a, uh, is, is basically a set of um, assembly-like uh, commands that you can put inside a, of the output. And what people do with these scripts is they encode uh, the, the keys of the sender and the receiver, uh, and, and, and they put that inside the script. And we'll see later when we look at the input, um, there's also a, a similar script build where you embed public and private keys, and, uh, and, and they act as basically like a lock. And so you can combine these, two. when you evaluate uh, the scripts of an input and output together, uh, you know, assuming every, uh, the data is set up correctly, you know, assuming you have the private key, or you can prove that you have the private key, then you can basically unlock this output so that you can spin it again. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm sure there, uh, there's, a, you know, a, there's a great deal of documentation online about the details of how all these scripts work uh, and, and how you can set them up correctly. Uh, so I really encourage you guys to take a look at the, uh, the Bitcoin developer guide to get, uh, yeah, question. Can, can you explain, are, are these data structures uh, part of the Bitcoin protocol? Are they part of Bitcoin B? Are they part of chains? Uh, internal tools. So up until now, these data structures are are, are a uh, Bitcoin protocol data structure. Yeah, th th these are what you will. Uh, um, these are this, you'll find guides to these data structures in the actual Bitcoin developer guide. So um, if you're looking to, um, to to see examples of these, uh, just take a look at, um, for instance, the Bitcoin D. They have an RPC mechanism where you can query a Bitcoin D instance. And they have uh, an RPC method called uh, get raw transaction or get raw block, and you'll receive that data back as JSON, and it'll look something like this. Does that make sense? Cool. And feel free to stop me anytime if, uh, if, if, if there's something I need to clarify or if you have any other questions. You guys with me so far? Mm -hmm. am, am I, is this 
uh, old news to some of you, or is it new, new, uh, new ground to any of you? No? Maybe. No. It's, okay. new, it's new to me. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the input. Uh, the input, again, references the transaction hash uh, that it's embedded in. And uh, if you recall, uh, I mentioned that the output has the index. And so what's, uh, what's interesting and like, what, kind of, uh, what, what took me a, a few minutes to get my wrapped around was the relationship between these inputs and outputs. And one interesting way to think about it is that if, you, uh, if, if somebody gave you Bitcoin, so somebody created a transaction and they referenced you as the output, uh, and let's say they gave you 50 Bitcoin, uh, and now you have, you know, on the ledger, you know, you have 50, you have an output that has 50 Bitcoin that has your, uh, your public key, you know, in the script. So uh, what you can do with that is you can build a new transaction, like if you wanted to spin that, for instance, uh, you would build a new transaction, and you would go find that, that, that transaction that had you in the output of 50 Bitcoin. You would find that thing, and you would build a new transaction, and you would reference, you would create a new input in this new transaction, and you would reference that previous traction, the transaction that had you listed as an output. And so that's how you're spending, uh, that's how you're spending this Bitcoin. And what's also interesting is that when you want to spend, when you want to create a new transaction and reference uh, a previous transaction where you were in the output, you have to, uh, in, in this new transaction, you have to spend all of the value that was in that previous transaction. So if I had, uh, if I had an, an output that had my name on it for 100 Bitcoin, when I create a, a new transaction and use that transaction as an input, I would have to spend the entire you know, 100 Bitcoin. And so the way that you kind of retain your value if you don't want to you know, give it all to somebody else is you do this thing called making change. And how you do that is you create, uh, in, in this new transaction, so you, you create it, you use a new input to consume that, that output that had you know, 50 Bitcoin or whatever in it. And your, your new outputs will go to somebody that you wanted to pay. And then you'll also give the remainder uh, minus some delta to, back to yourself. And they call that making change. So you're effectively just creating a new transaction for you to spend later. Um, and there's all sorts of guidance that, that you use when you uh, compute that delta, because that delta is the, the mining fee. So this, so you know, if, if I uh, gave somebody one bitcoin and I gave myself 98 bitcoin in change, there's one bitcoin that goes to the miner for including my transaction into a block. Well, not one bitcoin, not one whole bitcoin. <laughs> I, so I, I'm using whole numbers here because uh, that's just easier for me to think about. But uh, as he pointed out, that would be crazy uh, if you were to give uh, an entire Bitcoin to, uh, as mining fees. Uh, and like I said, I think there's all sorts of guidance that you can find on the internet as to what like is an appropriate um, uh, mining fee. Uh, so there's definitely some research to do there. Um, and you know, it's also especially when you think about developing applications that are building these new transactions, uh, you have to be careful. Uh, you know, because you don't want to make a mistake and you know forget to make change or you know do something weird in which like you you know you effectively give away all your Bitcoin. Um, it, it is uh, it is kind of dangerous. Um, so <clears throat> the last kind of object in play here is the address, uh, and there's not a whole lot. Actually, to my surprise, when I when I was first uh, getting interested in Bitcoin. I had a, made all these assumptions about what an address could do and what sorts of data the, uh, you know, Bitcoin D knew about with respect to address. And I was kind of disappointed as I moved along because I realized that all an address really is is a public and private key. Yes? Oh, sorry. I thought we had a question. Just a stretch. Um, but there's not a lot of there's not a lot of better information here. Like when when uh, when you see like an address posted on on the internet or something, it's uh, it's basically a, a computed hash of the public key that has embedded within it a version number, and then the pub key, and then a, ch a checksum on the end, and, that, and that's about it. There's not a whole lot of other data around there. So that's kind of so. With that in mind, in, 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 in with the understanding of those primitives, that's what kind of led us when we were building our, our Bitcoin applications to think, well, there's got to be like a set of higher order data structures. Um, that, that, that we can use to kind of build applications. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, and what really got us was the whole address thing. Because at the end of the day, what, what we were looking to build, just in, you know, thinking about iPhone apps or thinking about web apps, 
we were really wanted to find out like what happened to addresses because uh, more often than not addresses we could tie to a human and we were building software for humans and so we wanted to kind of have a rich data structure that would allow us to query data and to uh, find out about you know interesting information with respect to transactions and addresses and so that kind of led us to our first couple of things that we really wanted uh, from, from Bitcoin uh, and that was we wanted to get the address balance so you know, given uh, an address hash, uh, we an arbitrary address, you know, anything that was valid, we want to know the balance of that. Um, you know, how and that is to say, uh, we we were to we wanted to sum the values of the outputs for, that were associated with an address that had not been used as inputs. And it's kind of a mouthful, um, and, and but but that that's how you would you know kind of use the first principles to define what we were wanting. Uh, but at a high level, we just wanted to take an address, stick it to a function, and get back a balance. Uh, the second thing that we were really interested in doing was getting the list of the unspent transactions by address. Uh, so if we wanted to quickly you know, <coughs> give money to a cafe or something, like if we were building an app that allowed like, you know, iPhone checkout at a cafe or something, we would need to create a new transaction uh, and, and, and submit that to the blockchain uh, as a method of payment to the place that we were trying to make a purchase from. And so to do that, you know, uh, if, if you recall from the data structure review, we basically have to find an output uh, that is a, you know, that is referenced to us, uh, to, to me, the user, uh, you know, or the person who wants to spend the Bitcoin. I'd have to find that output, uh, and then I'd have to use it as input in a new transaction. And then in that transaction, the output would be referencing the person that I want to pay. Um, but I wanted to get very quick uh, quick access uh, to, to this data. And again, for arbitrary addresses, like I shouldn't need to know a priori, you know, what addresses I want to be operating on. So that was kind of like the, the first uh, engineering challenge that we set out to solve at Chain. It was like, okay, how can we build a system, how can we build it, uh, a database that would allow us to just get at this arbitrary address data? And so we ended up, uh, and this is, uh, this is like our V0 architecture. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot uh, in, in, in this slide here, and uh, we certainly are, are going to be thinking about uh, ways that we can improve it and do more interesting things with our data. But this is where we landed uh, for, 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 for today's API. Um, and basically how it works is we have, uh, we have Bitcoin D. So we, we run a fleet of uh, Bitcoin D nodes on top of AWS. And these, uh, these nodes are distributed all around the world in, uh, in auto-scaling groups. Um, and, and, and basically, we have, we have written this custom software that we call Link. And uh, Link reads data from, from a Bitcoin D node, and it blows it up, and it, in, it effectively indexes the data that comes out of the blockchain, and then it writes it into our own data tier. And so these, these, these tables that I've defined up here in the top quadrant are, uh, are chain data. So th that's, uh, that's one thing to keep in mind here, is that the data structures we've talked about previously have all been Bitcoin data structures and stuff here is, is the data structures that we've introduced uh, to, to help us get at that arbitrary address data. Um, and so, and, and Link effectively is just a set of functions that operates on, uh, so when a block comes in from Bitcoin D, that block again has a collection of all the transactions. And so Link is just effectively a set of functions uh, that, 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 that takes this data and then it puts it into this form, and then we write it out to, uh, to, a, to a relational database. Uh, we, we, we have all this data stored in a, a Postgres cluster. Uh, so I'll, I'll just quickly kind of walk through uh, these tables here. Um, but at, at the very highest level, we have our addresses table. And that was, that was kind of the first thing that we really wanted to, and we were really excited about building. So uh, you, know, you, you can just take any arbitrary address, and you can query this table, and you can get the balance by just taking the difference of you know, received and sent. Uh, and that will produce your balance. Um, and how we build that table is we use the, our address uh, diffs table. And so any time that, that link receives a transaction and it processes, it processes a transaction, it finds all of the addresses that were involved in that transaction and it computes a delta, basically. It says, okay, this, like in the, for this particular transaction, this particular address increased in its value by you know, some number, or this other address in the same transaction decreased uh, by, by, by some number. And so 
we write all of those, we call them diffs, we write all those diffs to a table. And uh, th this is actually, the, the table is quite large. Uh, so um, I think it's about 70 or 80 gigabytes of data. So you know, we have the, the 30 gigs of data that we, that we have in, in, in Bitcoin D, the, just the blockchain file. Uh, and then uh, all these tables here are quite large too. So by, by the time we're all said and done, like our, our database, uh, it, it sits at about uh, a half a terabyte and it, and it grows pretty quickly. Uh, if you're interested, I can show you guys some of our operational charts that we use uh, to monitor all of our, our, our data growth and our latencies and whatnot. They're, they're pretty interesting. Um, but anyway, so we have all these diffs and you can imagine um, a, SQL, a very simple SQL function that just you know, selects the sum of sent and received and groups by hash and that produces effectively the addresses table. Um, so as we, so, and, and what's also interesting is that Link is doing all of this index uh, uh, maintenance in, in real time. So as a new block and a new transaction comes into Link, it pre-computes all, all the data in these tables and then we write it out to these tables. So that way in our API layer, whenever we want to serve, say, the balance of an address, it's just a very simple, uh, often, uh, oftentimes it's just in memory, an in memory lookup to, you know, to, to, to compute that balance. So all the data gets pre-computed. Pre um, and likewise, uh, you know, we associate uh, the inputs and outputs for every transaction by address. And so this is what allows us to, say, get the list of unspent transactions for an address in, in short order. We can just go to this table and, and, and ask for all the, uh, the transaction hashes you know, for an address where, so one thing to note here is that on the add or transaction out table, uh, there's that, that field transaction in hash. And so uh, if the transaction in hash on that table is, or for a particular row, if that is null, then we know that that is unspent. And so that's like potential to be spent. So when somebody asks us, can you, know, can you give us the list of unspent transactions for a particular address, we just have to go to this table, query by that address, and then filter out everything that has a transaction in hash. Does that make sense? Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's kind of an overview. And then, you know, as I mentioned, we, we, we also then have a, another piece of software that is a very just simple HTTP server uh, that uh, takes in, you know, HTTP requests, it queries the database, and it builds a JSON response, and then it hands it back to, to the requester. So at a very high level, that's what the chain API is doing. Uh, and some interesting applications, some of the stuff that we've just kind of been building on top of this, are, uh, and, and we're actually really excited about this because it landed today, uh, but if you go to DuckDuckGo and you, uh, and you take a Bitcoin address and you paste it in the search bar, uh, you'll get the balance that is in that address and they're making a call to our, our API to, to get that. Um, so that's a cool thing that we're really excited about. Who has for that Bitcoin? That guy. Whoever that guy is. I don't know who that guy is. He's, he's pretty flush though, that's for sure. Um, I, don't, I don't know where, I think what I did, I can't remember how I got that address. Blockchain.info? Yeah, I probably just like watched a block as it went by and picked up uh, an address. Um, but then uh, we also have, we've been, like this is a, a very dumb block explorer, but um, we, we have a, uh, we have uh, cores uh, uh, header support on our API. And so this particular page right here, so ac actually if you click on that link, so if you look at a balancing, click more at morechain.com, it'll take you to this page here. And this is a cool page to look at. It's a cool page to, to view the source on, uh, because if you look at the source, it's just a very simple jQuery function uh, that has a, pub like a, basically a publicly available API key. And so, you don't need like a backend server at all to communicate with chain. You can just write a little jQuery function, uh, stick it on an HTML file, and you can build this page. Um, so that's one really cool application that we're excited about. Uh, and then the, the last example I have here is uh, something called Balance Badge. So you, you can check this out by going to balancebadge.com. And actually the source code for Balance Badge is on our GitHub page. But what Balance Badge does is you, uh, you send a request to balancebadge.com, and I think it's like balancebadge.com slash balance. Well, here, we can, we can actually do it live. Um, balancebadge.com. Yeah, so, and then let's see, do I have an address? Yeah, here's an address. So 
I can just take an address here. And you can see that it returns uh, this image. So if, if I if we can copy this image address, you can see here um, that you just pass in an arbitrary uh, address and it returns a dynamically generated ping image. And that ping image, every time that you request it, it'll fetch the balance that is in that address. So you could just like take the, you could take this URL and create like an image tag in HTML and stick it like on a I don't know a forum signature or whatever, and it'll always have the up to date balance. So these are like examples of well, balance badge in particular. Like I was actually really excited about building balance badge. Like I always kind of wanted it, but I never like it. it, it I never would have done it had I had to set up Bitcoin and then had to write all the software that kept computed all the balances for arbitrary addresses and stored them in a database. Like that's just way too much work for this silly little image generator. Um, and, and so that was kind of the, the fun thing that, that we were able to uh, leverage when we were working on the chain APIs. It's just like, oh yeah, now I can finally go back and build my balance badge because it, it's literally like, if you look at the source code for this, I think I wrote like eight or nine li lines of Ruby code to, to build this image. Uh, so it, it felt really good uh, to, to get that out of there. But anyways, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the high-level uh, high overview of, of what, we're doing at, um, what we're doing at Chain. And, and, and a bit, like I said, a very brief and uh, not, not too uh, specific overview of blockchain. I think there's a lot still that I, that I left on the table. Uh, so please, please do more research there. Um, Anyways, thanks for thanks for hearing me out, and I would definitely like to entertain some questions if, if anybody has any. You said you're doing other <laughs> cryptocurrencies besides Bitcoin. Yeah. So yeah, the question was anything else besides Bitcoin, uh, and a absolutely, you know, we would love to. Um, the way that we were thinking about designing our APIs is that, you know, they should be the API should be you know able to target any sort of any sort of cryptocurrency, we haven't um, we haven't started implementing any any of them yet. Mostly because we have so much demand for features on top of Bitcoin, and it's also like yeah, we we just have a, we see a lot of customer demand for Bitcoin, and Bitcoin has a lot of traction right now. Like it's crazy, but you know my my parents know Bitcoin, and like people that I run into on the street know about Bitcoin, um, and. They might not know about Dogecoin or Litecoin yet, and I don't know if they ever will. Uh, but they certainly know about Bitcoin, so that's like what's really getting us excited is being able to build software that like our parents, our grandparents hear on the news or something. Like, I think there's a lot of like cool and creative energy ar ar around the Bitcoin space, so that's kind of where we've been. That coupled with customer demand has been, you know, we've been keeping our focus on Bitcoin. Yes. So is there any future system plans to build APIs for other applications on top of Bitcoin, like voting? I, I, I didn't hear that last part. Voting. Like voting? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, Me, personally, I can't speak a whole lot to that because I haven't thought through a lot of the problems. But like I've, certain, I've certainly been a part of conversations like on threads and stuff where people talk about um, decentralized organizations and, um, and, and that sort of thing. I think at a high level, what's really interesting is that you know the blockchain has put up some really creative solutions to uh, to consensus. You know, something that like a lot of academics have been working on for a long time. Like, it's this weird intersection. What's what I think is funny actually is that uh, I've gone to a lot of Bitcoin conferences and stuff, and, and stuff, and as I've been kind of introduced into the community, and I've always uh, been been fascinated by their, their solutions to these database problems because the academic world and like the internet infrastructure world has been thinking about CAP theorem and they've been thinking about you know all these uh, uh, Paxos and all these consensus algorithms for a really long time uh, and the, the, the Bitcoin people like I, I haven't met a whole lot of people who, who who know what the CAP theorem is even let alone and so I, I think it's fascinating that they've kind of been solving this problem like almost in parallel uh, now there's different you know different cons constraints. You know, it takes about 10 minutes to confirm a block, so that doesn't work for a lot of transaction, uh, transactional systems, but I don't know, it, it's, it's interesting. So that was kind of a long-winded and roundabout answer to your question. I hope that it was satisfactory. Uh, yes? I, I didn't, you know, I see this. I think it's really fascinating and, and I'm pretty excited by it. But what, for you guys, what's the business model? What do you, I, I don't see where the revenue might be generated. Sure. So the question was about the business model for Chain, and uh, to be honest, like 
we we don't have like we, we don't have a lot of strong convictions there yet. Uh, we're, we're, we're certainly we, we, we certainly have some hypotheses, and we're testing those hypotheses with our current set of customers. And today, where we're at on this is that some people are going to be building businesses on top of our APIs, and these businesses might be like people who are making sales or people who are um, uh, people who are building a wallet or they're building an, an exchange, for instance. Uh, these are some of our current customers. And for them, they need an SLA just to know that our APIs will always be performant and that they'll never go down. And so our current thinking is that we're going to identify these businesses who are making like our, you know real money on top of our platform, and we're just going to charge them for an SLA, and we're going to provide them with a really quality service. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, we're also trying, it's an optimization problem because we, we want to be reliable and we want to be there for people and people want to pay us and so we'll, we'll accept their money but at the same time we, we want to enable like, the, we want to help proliferate Bitcoin and so we want to give hobbyists and developers and people who aren't going to be making money, we want to give them free access to these APIs. And as an example of that, our, like the, the, the jQuery example that I was talking about. Like that's an API, that, that API key, you would just find that on a, on a web page. Like you could, you could steal that from somebody. Like you could go to the example that I, I saw and you could take that API key and you could use it for yourself. Um, and so we want to see this, this, this world in which, you know, everybody is doing all sorts of really interesting things with, with Bitcoin data, um, but then at the same time, we're, we're also going to be thinking about how we can provide the best quality of services to businesses who need it. That's where we're at today. I don't know, thank you. Thanks. What other API calls are you going to do? So I see you have get address, get the spent, send a transaction. Is there other? Absolutely. Uh, so the, the uh, it, uh, I'll give you kind of a peek into our roadmap. The, the very next thing, so we just finished working on unspent by address. And the very next thing that we're going to be working on is a paginated API for all transactions by address. All right, so right, give me a, every transaction is address is ever. Right. Um, do you, is there something in there that you'd like to see? Um, not off the top of my head, I'm just, it just seems like there's only three. So I was just wondering, like, you know, how many you know, um, things you are, you're going to have. Um, yeah, so. Like I'll give you a little bit of our philosophy, even though you didn't ask about it. And like we're we're uh, we're hell bent on providing like the most like operationally robust API out there. Um, I, I uh, in, in my previous career, I had a lot of experience running uh, web operations for a, a pretty big uh, internet infrastructure company, and and I've kind of taken that focus to chain. And so we're we're. We're not going wide right now. We're just we're, we're trying to pick the right primitives that our customers have asked us for, and we're just trying to do those things really, really well. Um, but uh, again, I, I would love to hear like if, if as you guys are thinking about billing applications, and as you uh, maybe you'll give our API a try, and you'll say like, oh shoot, well I can't do this one thing that I wanted to do because your API sucks. Uh, you should absolutely tell us that because. Uh, if it's something easy, like we can get it done like that, you know, or if it's something that's kind of just like we just need to type some loose ends. Um, but, but we're also relying on the people who are using our product to help inform our roadmap. Um, we've, how we choose to work on problems is basically we talk to as many people as we can and we ask them what they want and then we group what they want and then we sort it by who, like the most people who have asked for it. <laughs> and so that's how we decide on what to, on what to work on. Um, maybe one day we can think about open sourcing that process to make it more uh, even transparent, but, but that's, that's how we're working today. Can you walk us through the send transaction? Because in order to send a Bitcoin transaction, you need your private key to sign the transaction. So that's a great question. Uh, so we have an API that allows you to pr propagate a transaction into the network. And uh, right, so today, the way that uh, we're thinking about private keys is that we do not want to touch them. And the reason why we take this stance now is because, um, Monk Ox. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's good. So th th there's a situation in which uh, you use one private key to sign a transaction. Um, there's new technology uh, called multi-signature transactions that helps mitigate some of these problems that, that, that happened at Mt. Gox. And that is where like, you could have a strategy where in order for a transaction to be valid, it needs uh, two out of three possible signatures. And then you have one private key with a service, and then you keep one private key you know, on your computer, and then you keep your third private key in your backyard. 
So at any given time, there's no one who can ever block you from sending your money because you have your key in your backyard and you have the key in your computer, right? So you can always spend your money. Uh, similarly, there's no way that the service provider who you gave your one key to can spend your money because they, they, they have to get one of your two private keys to be able to, to send the transaction. So we don't have a solution uh, for that uh, today. It's something that we spend uh, a lot of time thinking about and we're absolutely going to uh, have some sort of answer to that question. Um, so what you have to do today yes. is you have to be responsible for your private key. Yep. And so That's fine. you can, yeah, uh, and so what you do is uh, you can use, uh, like, there's a, a great JavaScript library that I use a lot. Um, it's called Bitcoin Lib.js. And it has all the functions that you need to build the transaction. And you can put your private key into memory in, your, in this JavaScript process. And you can sign a transaction. And it produces basically a, a hex string of that transaction. And then you take that hex string and you just send it to our, our API. And then we'll propagate it to the Bitcoin network for you. But that, that process of like building the transaction and signing it, it doesn't require a network connect, connection. It doesn't require a database. Like it just requires your private key. So you can, you can use uh, that knowledge to kind of architect a system that uh, behaves responsibly with that private key. Uh, and then the result that it produces is basically just you know, uh, data that you can just send over the network and put right into the Bitcoin network. Because you've used your private key to sign it and, to, uh, and so, so you can be guaranteed that no man in the middle can manipulate that data structure. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, 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 I get it. So, um, you have a, so you so you don't have a thing where you, if I send you my key in some way that you can't sign the transaction and send it. I have to sign it. You have I'll to sign, sign it. and then send you a hash of the thing I sign. Then you send it to the network. Yep. Okay. It basically uh, and and this is like this is a convenience. Like there's not a, a lot of heavy lifting that goes on with our send transaction API. We basically just take bytes off the network, yeah. which you sent to me, and we put them into the Bitcoin network. <laughs> like, it's just a transfer. Uh, there's not a lot of value out there, just out of its convenience. Um, if, if you wanted to, like, you, you could run a light node, or, or you could even build a piece of software yourself that could, like, send that data into the Bitcoin network. It wouldn't be too hard. There wouldn't be any databases involved, so you wouldn't have to worry about bootstrapping uh, a piece of software with gigabytes of data. You could just make a network call. Um, this is merely just a, con it's convenient. What do you think? Right. So I think that's something like everybody. Uh, but yeah, another round of applause for um,